Okay, um, I guess everyone is here. <clears throat> uh, we can start. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a brief introduction, and then uh, Dr. Chung will carry on. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, it is a distinct honor to introduce uh, Dr. David Chung, a uh, prominent figure in the field of neurocritical care and translational neurosciences, as our guest speaker for today's Grand Round Lecture. Uh, Dr. Chung, just to give a brief introduction, he's an assistant professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School uh, and a neurointensivist at MassGen and Boston Medical Center, where he also runs his own uh, neurovascular research lab. Uh, Dr. Chung's academic journey started with an undergraduate chemistry degree from Williams College and an MD PhD from Columbia, where he also trained for his neurology residency um, and also neurocritical care and research fellowships uh, at Harvard Medical School. Uh, Dr. Chung's research lab at Harvard is mostly focused on translational, preclinical, and clinical research approach to acute brain injury with special focus on aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, his lab has been continuously funded by NIH, NINDS, American Heart Association, Stoke Association, uh, the Harvard Weiss Institute, um, Andrew David Heitman Foundation, Foundation, and the Brain Aneurysm Foundation, just to mention a few. Uh, his lab work has been published in numerous uh, prestigious journals, and he also serves as an editorial board of Neurocritical Care Society's uh, journal. Uh, today, we are delighted to have Dr. Chung as our guest, uh, sharing his profound insights on translational neurology uh, of subarachnoid hemorrhage and smooth muscle vasculopathies. Um, Dr. Chung, thank you for being with us. Um, you have the podium. You can continue. Thank you. Johannes, thanks so much for that, that really nice introduction. Um, it, is this coming through okay? Yes, we can okay. see. That's great. That's great. It, it, it's a real uh, pleasure to to talk to this crowd. Um, I, I think really highly of, of, of the SUNY uh, programs and, and of downstate um, in particular, just because my residency class, we had three uh, people uh, come in from SUNY downstate. So um, Ina Clayman, uh, Steve Smith, um, and Charles Asenwa. Um, and then, of course, you have Shannon Weiss, who's now faculty there, who's a very good friend of mine. So, so it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I'll be talking to you today about um, subarachnoid hemorrhage and a smooth muscle uh, vasculopathy. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll, I'll explain a bit of the um, of what you're seeing in the slide uh, in, in a little bit. Um, so these are my disclosures. Um, I'll be it's mostly... Uh, not-for-profit funding other than uh, angiobiotherapeutics, which I'll talk to you a bit more about uh, shortly. So um, this is a brief outline of the talk uh, divided uh, roughly into three parts. Uh, the first part will be subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, the role of functional connectivity uh, after uh, brain injury from subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, and then what we'll try to do with that uh, with brain stimulation. The, uh, the second part of the talk will talk about uh, this phenomenon of cortical spreading depolarizations, which I'll tell you more about. And then finally, I'll talk about this uh, genetic uh, acti acti 2 vasculopathy and some of the efforts that we're trying to uh, uh, make um, as part of like a very large collaboration to try to cure this genetic vascul vasculopathy in kids. Um, but so the first part, uh, aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, it's uh, probably known to many of you. So just very briefly, um, right, an aneurysm, a brain aneurysm is like basically a blister in one of the cerebral arteries. Um, and uh, that can be okay uh, as long as it doesn't rupture. Um, and so as a neurointensivist, uh, we, we see these folks come in with ruptured aneurysms. And it's uh, many times synonymous with subarachnoid hemorrhage because the large vessels uh, in the brain uh, run in the subarachnoid space. Um, and so this potential space becomes filled with blood. Um, why this matters, uh, it affects about 30,000 Americans each year. It's a minority of strokes, but it has a disproportionately high amount of uh, morbidity and mortality. Um, about a third die within the first month, uh, all comers. Uh, a major complication that you may have heard of is this um, 
is large vessel uh, arterial vasospasm, also known as delayed cerebral ischemia. That's associated with about 50% of deaths. Um, but uh, additionally, even folks who don't have this uh, well-known complication uh, can go, still go on to have long-term deficits um, in, in survivors that persist. And there, there's some you know, work looking at that, um, looking at these long-term cognitive deficits in survivors of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And there's been an association with these cognitive deficits, uh, you know, problems with memory, problems with sitting still, problems with executive function. There's been an association with those cognitive deficits um, and alterations in resting state functional, functional connectivity and different kinds of functional connectivity. And that uh, work has been done in humans. And so one of the approaches that uh, we want to do is to try to figure out what the causal mechanism is. You know, is the altered functional connectivity actually causing the disordered um, behavior and cognition? And if it is, is there something we can do about it? And so uh, the approaches that we you know, that we take is to is to start in the lab uh, to try to tease out these mechanisms. Um, and to that end, we have this mouse model of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, which you see here in upper left, uh, you see a needle getting inserted into the anterior part of a mouse uh, skull in vivo under anesthesia. Uh, we reflect the uh, scalp so you can see the underlying um, brain through this thin mouse skull, which is uh, translucent um, because you know it's thin enough to, to see through with uh, just regular uh, visible light imaging. And then you can see that during the injection uh, in blue, there's a decrease in the blood volume uh, caused by increased ICP. And then you all can also see blood tracking up the MCA territory of the mouse, which is um, in the subarachnoid space uh, that the MCAs are going into. And so this is our mouse model and we follow this to make sure the injections are good. Um, again, this is just showing you different um, places. We place the needle in anteriorly and then the tip is at the base of the skull, just like many aneurysms. Um, and then our experimental setup is that we can place a, a clear cranial window over this intact skull so that we can do repeated uh, visible light imaging in these mice. And so the purpose of the visible light imaging in these mice are to look at spontaneous fluctuations in uh, blood volume so that we can do imaging akin to the fMRI bold imaging that you do in humans to assess functional connectivity. And so uh, we, we do the injury induction or sham, we can do the residency functional connectivity imaging, and then we have a battery of behavioral tests that you can do. And so just getting right to the point, uh, this is published, we you know, do sham uh, needle insertion versus injecting blood, and we see alterations in uh, resting state networks. So in the upper row, uh, our normal resting state networks that are seed-based um, in the mouse. And then after subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you know this is uh, five days after subarachnoid hemorrhage, we see um, really messed up uh, functional networks. And this persists out to one month and three months following injury. Um, furthermore, on, on top of how different parts of the brain are connected to each other, we can look at the magnitude uh, or the characteristics of the signal itself, of the, of the bold-like signal itself. And so in the sham mouse, you can see these uh, fluctuations in blood volume. After subarachnoid hemorrhage, those fluctuations are really attenuated. Um, and then this happens early, um, but uh, actually this, this uh, starts to resolve uh, at the later time points. And so you have alterations in resting state networks, alterations in the signal itself, but they don't necessarily go together. Um, and so I just mentioned blood volume imaging, hemodynamic imaging, but what we really care about is neurons. And so what we're working on now is we have these transgenic mice where you can see calcium activity um, in neurons uh, with fluorescence imaging. And so we can simultaneously image the uh, blood vessel, uh, the, the blood flow and image uh, neuronal activity at the same time. And so um, in this lower left uh, panel uh, is, the, is the blood volume imaging. And in the lower right panel is this corrected uh, neuronal imaging. And so we can apply the similar kind of uh, resting state network analysis um, before and after the subarachnoid hem hemorrhage imaging. 
And then this is using a different modality of functional connectivity where we relate every pixel in one hemisphere to its, its mirror pixel and contralateral hemisphere. And we can see that when we look at this neuronal G-CAMP connectivity, that after subarachnoid hemorrhage, we have attenuation of that. And then in the same mice at the same time, we can look at the hemodynamic connectivity, not just with total hemoglobin, but like the oxygenated portion of hemoglobin. And we also see attenuation of that. So furthermore, um, we see that uh, when you see if the G-CAMP neuronal signal goes together with the hemodynamic signal, um, if there's decoupling or coupling between that, we see that after subarachnoid hemorrhage, we do see some decoupling between hemodynamic and neuronal signals. So this is just a snapshot to give you a flavor of the sort of work that we do. Um, and then, you know, we're working on trying to put this together for publication. Um, so I've given you just the surface imaging. I've said that we can do optical imaging, uh, you know, akin to fMRI, uh, but we could also do fMRI. Um, of course, um, it's not always so practical because to, to get the, the scanning time um, and, and to do the scans, uh, the throughput is much less, but it's helpful to complement our optical work with actual MRI because then we can look at deeper nodes in the brain. And so this is just an example of a control mouse versus a subarachnoid hemorrhage mouse looking at a seed-based connectivity map in the retrosplenial cortex just to show, uh, to demonstrate that we can see differences in this one case. And, uh, we're slowly making our way through a cohort of mice uh, to work on this further. Um, this is a 14 Tesla MRI that we have at MGH. Um, so that allows us to get really good temporal and spatial resolution. Um, and then uh, the, the, the final piece with the subarachnoid hemorrhage story, this functional connectivity story, is that, you know, what does it all mean, right? Like you can see these different things changing, but you actually want to, you really need behavior as well. Um, and so uh, in these same mice, we can run through a battery of behavioral tests. Um, we have the Morse water maze, which is a maze for um, the mice swim around. They try to find some hidden platform. Um, so it's a test of spatial and working memory. An open field test is a test of, um, you can look at anxiety and you can look at just ambulation. Uh, the rotor rod is a test of motor coordination. And then the Y maze is another test of uh, working uh, in spatial memory. And so what we see is we see uh, deficits in the Morris water maze. We see deficits in the Y maze for working in spatial memory that persist out to three months. Um, but we don't see so many deficits in other things. So the rotor rod, um, for whatever reason, the subarachnoid hemorrhage animals seem to do a little bit better early on, but um, uh, after multiple trials, they seem to do fine. Um, and the open field test early on after uh, the injury, they don't walk around as much, but they recover at one and three months. Uh, however, they don't recover their cognition. Um, I'm talking about cognition. Um, and so we've started to expand our, um, our uh, battery of cognitive tests. Um, I always felt bad swimming mice because mice naturally don't like to swim. Um, and so there's another maze called, called the Barnes maze, which tests a similar thing. The mouse tries to find an escape hole instead of trying to find some hidden platform somewhere. Um, and so we've run um, several mice through this and we find like the, the Barnes maze works very well uh, to assess for cogn uh, cognition, uh, memory and, and spatial memory. Um, and then the other test that we're really excited about is we have a collaborator who's uh, let us use these operant conditioning boxes where there's uh, there are different pictures that come up on a touch screen, as you can see up here, you can run a few mice at the same time. And it's automated, so you don't have a human hand coming in all the time. And then if the mouse uh, gets the correct picture, they get, uh, they get a, a treat of a strawberry milkshake, which they like very much. And so you can see here that with saline injected mice, there's no difference in the learning pre and post injection, but, after, but with subarachnoid hemorrhage, the mice learn um, the, the, how, how to touch the correct um, screen um, pre-injection, but post-injection when, when they try to do it again, uh, they, can't, they can't get it with a different picture. Um, and so these are, these are additional things that we're working on. Um, but I think what we can conclude overall is that optical imaging can be used to determine functional connectivity following subarachnoid hemorrhage in mice. That subarachnoid hemorrhage leads to early and persistent changes in functional connectivity. And that subarachnoid hemorrhage leads to early and persistent cognitive deficits.
Um, but there's still plenty of work to do to try to sort out more of this. So some of that additional work is um, to see if there's something we can do about it, right? And so uh, I've shown you some disordered networks. What if we fix them? And what if fixing those disordered uh, networks, neuronal hemodynamic networks, what if that actually rescues cognition? What if we can make the mice perform better on those mazes? And so that's what this is here. Uh, we have this. Uh, we have these mice that are optogenetic mice. So it, um, the transgenically has um, a light responsive uh, channel that when you shine blue light uh, on, on the brain, on, on a particular region, that those neurons activate. And so uh, we are doing this by we, we can now do this stimulation anywhere in the brain, but uh, we find that there's a particular network node, the retrosplenial cortex, which is implicated in, in memory. And what we what you're seeing here is just a proof of principle that we can do the stimulation and detect what happens uh, bef before and after the stimulation. So, so up here um, is uh, the just the hemodynamic changes. Um, here you're seeing the stimulation um, uh, interleaved with uh, hemodynamic imaging, and then uh, here this post stimulation the, the resting state networks. And then when you apply the seed based analysis that I showed you in a slide earlier, you see these, these network maps. And then post-stimulus, you can see a consolidation of, um, of the retrosplenial node uh, that you can't really tell just by looking at the video. Um, and so these are healthy mice as proof of concept. And now we wanna start doing this uh, in injured mice to see uh, if, if we can improve things. All right, so how are we doing on, I think we're doing okay on time. Um, so, so this is the second part of the talk. Um, and this part of the talk is uh, addressing this concept of cortical spreading depolarizations. All right, I think I saw a little pause. Okay. And, um, and so, Cortical spreading depolarization. I think as neurologists, many of you uh, know about um, this uh, scintillating scotoma or uh, you know fortification uh, spectra that, that go out in the setting of migraine with aura. Um, and this is described um, literally as the uh, 19th century in the 1800s. Um, people with migraine with aura seeing these um, moving tectopsias moving out. And there have been several descriptions of this clinically. Um, and so, so what is that from, right? And so um, I'll just give it away. So we basically, we, we think that they're from this phenomenon called cortical spreading depolarizations, um, which were described um, sort of separately from migraine with aura um, in the, the mid uh, 20th century by this uh, graduate student at the time, um, Aristides uh, Liao, um, who was doing his work uh, in a seizure lab, an epilepsy lab at Harvard University. And so this is uh, the cover page to his uh, thesis that's deposited at the Harvard University archives. Um, and in it, um, he uh, describes this spreading depression of cortical activity. So he's working in rabbits. And so what you're seeing here is the right hem a schematic of the right hemisphere of the, of the rabbit brain. And he put electrodes in here, uh, numbered one through seven. And then in the posterior part of the rabbit uh, brain, he put a stimulating electrode. And he was hoping to see seizures. He was hoping that he was going to stimulate this and see seizures. And here you can see in a bipolar montage, the spontaneous activity before stimulation. Um, and then starting at B and, and, and going forward, you're seeing uh, the activity um, post-stimulation. And you can see there's a depression of spontaneous activity and then this spreads. And you can also notice how very slow it is, how slow this spread is, right? Uh, if you look at this time scale. And it ends up uh, that these um, spreading depressions travel at the speed uh, throughout the brain um, of about three to five millimeters per minute. So very slow. So the videos that I've showed you, the spreading depolarization, spreading depressions, um, are sped up a great deal. Um, so uh, so then you know 
how do we connect this to migraine with aura? Well, um, so people have, uh, going going back to fMRI and going back to bold signal imaging, uh, they found a patient uh, who had migraine with aura with a pretty reliable trigger. I think, I believe this particular patient um, that has been, been described is uh, got migraine with aura with um, when when they played basketball, and so they they brought them. Um, to, to a lab, to an MRI lab, and then had them play basketball outside. When they felt the migraine coming on, they you know, jumped into the scanner and then got this image here. And you can see um, using the bold signal that they see the spread of activity that goes at approximately um, three to five millimeters per minute. Um, and then um, it's correlated with this, this spreading tectopsia that the patient described. And so this is how this has been connected, how cortical spreading depressions have been connected to um, migraine with aura. You, you hear me inter, uh, saying CSDs, cortical spreading depolarizations, cortical spreading de depressions, they're all synonymous with each other, which I won't get into right now, but um, but, but they're all the same thing. And so, so what is it? it, it when, when you see this wave coming across, it, it's you're, what it represents is a depolarization of all cell types, not just neurons, but glia. And then with that, and uh, with the depolarization and the subsequent repolarization, you have massive uh, transients um, in, in, in ion, uh, ion concentration uh, and water shifts. Um, and then I'm, I won't get too into it, but you just a lot of different things change, right? And a lot of different compartments, a lot of different cell types. Um, some of the, the key um, cell types and, and, and factors that are involved is neuronal uh, calcium. Um, and this is just two photon imaging from, from another lab, uh, just to demonstrate this point. Um, you also see uh, ast astrocytes um, getting affected. Uh, you also see extracellular glutamate going up. And then um, there's no uh, potassium uh, imaging, but uh, when you put in a potassium electrode, you can see extracellular potassium going up as well. Uh, from this repolarization. And that may be another reason why you get depolarization of adjacent um, cell types from just this massive increase in potassium that may depolarize uh, adjacent cells just by contiguity. Um, and so I've described CSDs in the setting of relatively healthy people with migraine with aura. Um, and so uh, the reason why I, I care about, about them, although of course, like we want to help folks with migraine with aura, is because CSDs have been implicated in additional injury in the setting of um, subarachnoid hemorrhage, in the setting of ischemic stroke, in the setting of TBI, intracerebral hemorrhage, subdural hematomas. Um, but since this is a talk about subarachnoid hemorrhage, and um, I'll, I'll tell you about uh, just uh, focus on this one example with subarachnoid hemorrhage in people. Um, so this is from a group in Berlin. Uh, where they place subdural electrodes after craniotomy for an aneurysm clipping. And um, in this classic paper, they describe a patient who developed these spreading depolarization, spreading depressions, which you can see uh, here. And that development um, of these phenomena uh, was uh, correlated with an exam change where the patient was totally intact and then becomes stuporous. Um, not only that, they uh, found an association in a population of patients in their cohort where they looked at the depression of the spontaneous uh, subdural electrode activity. Uh, they looked at the association with the amount of that and risk of delayed cerebral ischemia and infarcts. And so you can see in a delayed way, uh, patients can develop in infarcts who have these CSDs. And so, um, so the thought is, these CSDs are causing injury, right? And so going you know, further with that, uh, this is um, a slide, this is uh, some work uh, by my mentor, uh, Jen Kayata at MGH, um, where he's interested in ischemic stroke. And so he did a very elegant experiment where um, he induced an ischemic stroke and then did uh, blood flow imaging. So this, the blue is decreased blood flow. And then um, the penumbra area of this decreased blood flow of the stroke is where the forelimb 
of the mouse is represented. And so he did this four, um, four limb stimulation when you see the red dot. Uh, when you see the red dot, he did four limb stimulation. And then right after you see the red dot go on, you're gonna see this spreading to polarization kind of erupting out of where that four limb is. And so when um, those mice were sacrificed and he, look, he looked at the brains, he found that when you had this four limb stimulated mice with these spreading to polarizations that they had bigger strokes. So there's also a suggestion here that spreading to polarizations are causing uh, worse strokes um, in mice after, after, um, after ischemic stroke. So we, wa we wanted to extend this finding by seeing if we could stimulate the brain directly, not actually go and do four limb somatosensory stimulation, but just stimulate the brain directly to cause this spreading to polarization. And so uh, one of the first things I did when I, when I joined the group was to, uh, was to develop this technique where we take these transgenic optogenetic mice and not do like nice gentle stimulation, but do so much stimulation um, that uh, you can get a spreading to polarization, but not so much that you cause uh, injury. And so we found a protocol uh, fr from the stimulation itself. So we found a protocol uh, to do that. Um, and then not only that, we found a protocol to do it um, relatively non-invasively um, by placing a cranial window or, or implanting optical fibers um, where we can then induce spreading to polarization using, um, using light in these optogenetic mice and then detect um, whether the spreading to polarization occurred. And so this is just visible light imaging here. That's just difference imaging that folks can do with a USB camera. Um, this is a little fancier using laser Doppler flowmetry where we can detect these spreading to polarizations. Um, and so th this is ongoing work for subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, I've been really wanting to see um, what the role of spreading to polarizations are in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, and so uh, taking the work that I showed you earlier, inducing spreading to polarizations, and then seeing if that makes the outcomes worse, right? And so already just with some pilot data, we can see that inducing spreading to polarizations um, messes up the resting state func functional connectivity maps. You can see that if you look at the power of the bold signal itself, that that's decreased on the spreading to polarization side. Um, but, you know, why... Uh, why are we bothering to look, right? Because it seems so obvious that the spreading to polarization is going to be bad, right? Um, and if you're interested in reading more, um, we wrote a, uh, I, I wrote with um, a postdoc at the time, Kazutaka Sugimoto, a review of this. Um, so, so as far as, as far as why, um, why we're actually testing it, I'll, I'll get to that in, in a little bit. I, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, um, all right, so uh, now I'm gonna switch over to clinical detection of spreading to polarization. Um, because you saw the invasive intracranial um, uh, detection of spreading to polarization. You can't do that everywhere, right? And so if you wanna detect them to see if they're helpful, uh, if it's helpful to try to stop them or intervene or use them as a biomarker, we can't, we can't be placing intracranial electrodes everywhere. And so um, there's a lot of work trying to do these sorts of things non-invasively with um, scalp EEG. And so some of, much of this is inspired by this, uh, the work of Jennifer Kim, um, who, uh, who uh, looked at uh, scalp epileptiform uh, activity on EEG and found a correlation with risk of delayed cerebral ischemia after subarachnoid hemorrhage and vasospasm after subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, uh, and, and Jennifer's uh, now at, um, at Yale as, a, as an attending neurointensivist. Um, but we wanted to build on this concept that she, that she found. Um, and so uh, I've been collaborating, collaborating with Eric Rosenthal. Um, and then we published a paper with Eric's um, fellow uh, Shravan Sivakumar, trying to see um, if, if scalp epileptiform activities can predict DCI and if um, CSDs predict DCI, then could scalp epi uh, epileptiform activity predict CSDs, right? It's kind of like, I guess, the transitive property of all of this. 
Um, and so Eric had built this um, cohort of patients uh, where uh, he was measuring intracranial, um, uh, uh, he, he was measuring uh, electrical activity intracranially with ECOG. Um, and we looked for CSDs and we found CSDs in uh, six uh, out of uh, approximately 35 patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage and, and TBI. And this is an example of, of one uh, set of spreading depolarizations we found in, 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 a, in a representative patient. This is a negative study. I'm just going to tell you, there's a lot of stuff here. Usually when you see a complex figure like this, um, it's because it's negative. Um, and so we really tried to find a, um, a, a relationship between um, epileptiform activity and CSDs, and we could not. Um, what I'm showing you here are, are five uh, people where we uh, with subarachnoid hemorrhage, where we detected CSDs, and you can see that um, some had a lot, like a big cluster, and then uh, some patients just had a few CSDs up front. So why am I telling you this? I'm, I'm telling you about this because this negative study uh, led to another collaboration that I'm very excited about. Um, and so we were presenting this negative study um, at, a, at, a, um, at the COSBID meeting, at a CSD meeting. Um, and then also uh, we, uh, you know, I, I saw a presentation uh, from this group from uh, Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University and UPMC, where uh, there was, um, where there's, uh, uh, these folks are trying to non-invasively detect spreading depolarizations using scalp EEG. And in collaboration with folks from University of Cincinnati, they, Cincinnati has a cohort of patients without the, the skull on um, intact. And so uh, the scalp EEG is detecting um, uh, signals uh, without a, an intact skull. And then they also still had ground truth of um, CSDs occurring with intracranial electrodes. And so we uh, formed a collaboration where we would um, use this non-invasive detection of CSDs, but in an in with intact skull. And so MGH has an intact skull cohort. And so just um, this is Ali Reza and Polka Grover's algorithm that they were able to figure out. In short, um, they're able to take the raw scalp EEG uh, signal, which is compressed here, look at um, the, the slow activity, like delta activity, pull out the power of the delta activity, and then together with looking at the vectors formed by other uh, electrodes on the scalp, figure out um, if there's like if there's a wave front of, of moving um, delta power activity. And then, so using that um, and um, build, building on the, the hemicraniectomy, no skull cohort and, and training with our intact skull cohort um, in one patient with TBI, uh, one representative patient with subarachnoid hemorrhage, um, you can see that there is this these waves that um, travel, uh, this is very sped up, but they travel um, at the rate of spreading to polarization. And so this is a very promising thing in my mind where we can actually uh, potentially one day have non-invasive detection of spreading to polarizations. All right, so... Um, so moving on, um, I want to inject some skepticism, right, about whether or not spreading depolarizations are harmful or not, right? And so you saw examples where spreading depolarizations are harmful. I'm going to show you an ex a few examples of where um, they aren't. They're either benign or they could be helpful. And so this is an example of a patient uh, of a of a uh, paper that we published looking at the role of spreading depolarizations in seizures um, using a mouse model of seizures. And what you're seeing here in this video, or you, you, you're seeing a blood volume imaging um, where you see the, the brain kind of pulse on the right is when there's a seizure happening. And then you're seeing these spreading depolarizations coming out of it. And so are these spreading depolarizations and making things worse or could they potentially be making things better? And so to test that in a separate experiment, um, we induced, excuse me, um, in a separate experiment, you can see you know, baseline spontaneous activity here, and then we induced a seizure uh, pharmacologically, and you can see the seizure here on the spectrogram as well. You can see the increase in power uh, in the, in the 
um, in these inserted uh, glass micropipettes uh, that we did to assess um, activity. And then we induced a CSD externally. And that CSD that was induced stopped the seizure. So this is an example of where CSD can stop a seizure and make things better potentially. Um, this is ex an example of um, from the same paper where you um, block CSDs, right? And so uh, there's an, MD an MDA receptor antagonist called MK801 that is convenient to use experimentally. To remind everybody, ketamine, for example, is another uh, well-known clinically used NMDA receptor antagonist. Um, and in this case, when we block the CSDs with ketamine, we made the seizures worse, right? And so these darker um, uh, dots are where uh, MK801, this blocking of CSDs um, was done. And then the seizure intensity is, is worse. And then not only that, uh, this figure here shows the spatial extent of the seizures. And then in gray, you, you see that the spatial extent is also greater when you block CSDs. So just uh, something to, to temper everything that I just told you. Um, another example um, is that in the setting of intracerebral hemorrhage with a growing hematoma, this is a, a model of um, intracerebral hemorrhage where you inject a little bit of collagenase, you cause um, intracerebral hemorrhage intraparenchymally in, in the mouse. Um, and CSDs were, were induced externally. And when you externally induce CSDs, you actually uh, decrease the growth of the hematoma, likely due to a mechanism of vasoconstriction that we think is typically bad to get vasoconstriction. But maybe if you're actively bleeding, it's good to vasoconstrict. So here's another example with a different mechanism that CSDs could potentially be beneficial. Uh, and then finally, um, this is uh, uh, to sort of close the loop on the ischemic stroke story. Um, so uh, we were able to do that follow-up study where we induce CSDs externally to follow up on that somatosensory forelimb um, induced CSD paper where strokes were bigger and outcomes were worse. But when you don't do that somatosensory evoked uh, uh, CSDs, when you just cause a CSD uh, using this optogenetic approach that I described uh, in the brain directly, we, we don't see an increase in the stroke size. And actually, it kind of looks like maybe there's a signal towards the strokes being smaller in this particular case. Um, and so I think uh, it's important to take different approaches. It's important to be careful um, and to to um, really be careful with how you hypothesize and, and how you pose your questions. And we can talk, if there are questions, we can talk about a bit more, you know, why this might be. Right, so then there's a question, why, when are CSDs harmful? When are they beneficial? Um, I really believe it's worth looking at things empirically. We really just have to design good rigorous studies uh, to figure out which patients and, and animals might benefit um, for with particular approaches. All right, so um, we're doing, I think we're doing okay with time. I think I have time to talk about this last component, um, this, this last part. Um, and so uh, this is an exciting collaboration that, that I wanted to tell you all about. Um, it doesn't quite fit in with all the other stuff, but um, it, it's a collaboration that's very meaningful to me because uh, we're, we're trying to cure a genetic vasculopathy in kids with gene therapy. And um, it, this effort is led by uh, Patty Mussolino, who is, uh, is, David Lerner knows, you know, uh, you know, one of the attendings at MGH, uh, neurocritical care, also pediatric neurologist and stroke neurologist. Um, and so she got inspired by all of this because she was caring for uh, patients who were being referred to her. Uh, with this um, acted to a smooth muscle vasculopathy. And my role in all of this is to help characterize a mouse model um, of, this, of this disease and then try to cure the mouse model with gene therapy uh, before moving on to people.
So what is this? So the act of two smooth muscle vasculopathy is caused by a point mutation um, at arginine 179 in the act of two gene, which is an, uh, one of responsible for making one of the actin monomers. Um, and uh, so basically when you throw in this mutant monomer, then the actin and smooth muscle can't polymerize. And so you have ineffective smooth muscle cells um, where this uh, gene is expressed. Um, you can make the diagnosis at birth. The, the main way that you make the diagnosis is that you look at the kid's eyes. And so there, there's congenital, there's a congenital bilateral fixed and dilated pupils. Um, and then uh, because the smooth muscle in uh, blood vessels are messed up, uh, you can get the kids get stroke when, once they're walking. They also have problems with the aorta. People have tried all sorts of things with trying to treat uh, the, the kids and, and uh, nothing seems to be effective. Um, here's an example of a, of a angiogram, you know, normal um, child. And then this is um, a child who has this vasculopathy. Um, and so this is just a snapshot of the natural history. Just to give you a sense of um, the course, you get these um, abnormal cerebral arteries early on. You get um, both white matter and um, uh, territorial strokes, um, and then uh, medical complications, um, and then death as, as young adults. Um, just a bit more, um, right? So just uh, zooming in. So you get white matter disease, um, and then this is an example of a, of a patient who uh, went in for surgery. Uh, they developed you know, bilateral AC infarcts, and then they just kept developing these infarcts. All right, so um, just to remind everybody, this is a cross-section of, of a cerebral artery. Um, there are different you know, uh, areas, right, including the intima, um, and then the um, and then like the the area with the, the smooth muscle cells, and um, and so in the normal uh, in normal people you get this wrinkle that is um, an artifact of the of the fix of the fixation um, phase, uh, which is in the the internal uh, elastica, and then um, after, with the active two mutation you you lose that wrinkle. We have this mouse model um, of the disease and you see a similar sort of thing going on as well. And so it, the mouse model recapitulates um, the, the histology and, 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 the, and, and the cell types, in, at least in the, in the cerebral vessels. Um, also looking again at, at a comparison between the mouse and the human, um, in, in the mice, so on the left here in the mice is the control. On the right is, um, uh, the, uh, the, the mutant, uh, where, uh, there's a promoter that expresses the, um, the, uh, the mutation in all smooth, smooth muscle cell types. Um, and then you can, you can see a similar kind of straightening of the arteries here. Um, when you look at the, uh, diameter of the arteries at the base of the skull, there's also a decrease in the diameter of the arteries at the base of the skull. Um, and so that's using histology, uh, or that's using just, uh, that was using just black ink injection in, in, in my lab. Um, but uh, we've started another collaboration um, uh, with Shin Yu, who is the person who, um, who manages the 14 Tesla MRI, um, Joanna Yang, who's a lab technician um, in my lab. And we uh, were able to image a few of these mice um, and uh, look at the volume of the corpus callosum. Um, and so we find that the active two mice have smaller corpus callosums. And then when we do uh, non-contrast uh, vessel imaging uh, using this mouse MRI, you can see a recapitulation of some of the vascular uh, findings where you get straightening um, of, the, uh, of the arterial tree. Um, and then now going back to resting state functional connectivity, we, we took that approach also in these mice. Um, I think one of the more interesting things is to look at the magnitude of the vascular fluctuations. And so um, the top is control, so without the promoter, the bottom is the mutant with the, with the, uh, with the gene being um, expressed in, in the brain. And you can see that when you do this, similar kind of 
kind of bold like imaging that you see decreased fluctuations, um, vascular function fluctuations in the mutant mice. On top of that, when you do the functional connectivity um, analysis, and this is just a non-biased, non-seed-based functional connectivity analysis that I uh, briefly referred to, the mutant mice have decreased by hemispheric connectivity. And then when you look at this other measure of connectivity that we have, looking at how every pixel is connected to every other pixel, um, we see decreased amount of this global connectivity as well. Um, and um, additionally, we want to assess behavior. Uh, the active two mice, they, they ambulate less. Um, and then on top of that, um, they're a bit more shy, so they stay more towards the edge of the cage as well. Um, but right, we, what we really want to know is um, not just ambulation, but we want to see uh, what cognition is like. And so we're applying this kind of uh, operant conditioning approach to these mice as well. And, and this is ongoing um, and it's work that uh, Joanna, Alyssa Albert, and Lydia Hawley, um, technicians in my lab are, are uh, performing now. All right, almost done. There, there's three more slides, three more slides. Um, and so this is uh, blood flow imaging. Um, this is the first opportunity I've been able to tell you about some of the blood flow imaging that, that we do in, in my lab. Um, this is something called laser speckle flowmetry, where we can look at um, the blood flow across the entire surface of the mouse brain. And so in the upper left, that red image, the, the brighter the image is, the, the, brighter, uh, the, the more blood flow there is. The middle image where it's uh, becoming more and more blue, that's relative blood flow compared to the reference at the beginning. So the bluer that gets, the less blood flow there is relative to that reference. On the right is cerebrovascular resistance. Uh, which is a ratio of the mean arterial pressure to the blood flow. And in the bottom, you can see the white tracing is the mean arterial pressure. The blue tracing is heart rate. And then where you see these breaks is where we're bleeding the animal through an arterial line. We have an arterial line that's inserted into the femoral artery of the mouse so that we can do um, mean arterial pressure monitoring. And you can see that you can see this decrement in blood flow uh, with this decrement in the mean arterial pressure. Um, and as many of you may know, we can then do make autoregulation curves. Um, and so when we uh, do this experiment uh, where we bleed the animal and you can see the blood pressure dropping on, on, the, on the left slide, we can generate these autoregulation curves that you can see on the right um, from, this, from this controlled uh, bleeding. And the act two mice we find have lower baseline blood, uh, they have lower baseline blood flows. Um, and then as you bleed the mice, um, the, the blood flow remains um, persistently depressed. And so this is an assay that we have now where we can, um, uh, where we can assess our regulation, we can assess, assess baseline blood flow. And then the idea is, why don't we start doing gene therapy so with viral transfection uh, of these of these cell types, and then we can see, let's see if we can rescue this. So so that's the concept. And if we can do that, uh, then we'll have an opportunity to try this in, in people. Um, and then finally, I, I mentioned um, that uh, the way that this diagnosis of the ACTA2 um, vasculopathy is made in kids is at birth you can see that they're pupils are fixed and dilated. And so, um, so we've taken that approach in the lab. And so, um, so, so we made a pupilometer, which you can see over here. Um, and um, you can see in a wild type mouse, you shine the light and then the pupil constricts. Um, but in the mutant, uh, there is a light turning on, I promise you. Um, you can maybe see a little reflection of it as well. Um, and the, the, the image isn't getting totally um, white it out because we have an infrared uh, filter um, on, on the camera as well. And so this is actually a very bright light, but um, this infrared filter is, is filtering out the bright light and only letting in some infrared light that we're also shining on the eye. And so um, again, um, the mutant mice have a fixed and dilated pupil. The idea is this could be a marker for if we do gene therapy, if we do gene therapy in the mice, um, that 
can we make that pupil constrict again? All right, well, thanks so much for your attention. Um, uh, this is just a picture of a bunch of folks from my lab and from the larger neurovascular research group. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take questions if there's time. Um, I'm also just happy to stay on later as well um, if, if people would like to chat more about anything. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Chung, um, for that in-depth uh, lecture. Um, anyone who has a question can unmute or you can just type it in the chat box and uh, we'll read it out. I'm also going to show you a picture of my of my uh, my golden retriever puppy. Um, this is from a few years ago, but I, I still like showing you. Okay, all right. So I, I see I see a um, comment. Uh, so I'll just read it uh, back. So perhaps I may not have heard correctly. Did you mention that NMDA antagonists, for example, ketamine? inhibit CSDs, um, which is not good for seizures. Yeah. So, so right, so for an experimental design, um, uh, I, 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 like, I think, so, so we designed this like this, um, I think in a, in a good way, right? So NMDA receptor antagonists have been looked at in stroke a, a lot, right? And especially with um, CSDs. Back when back when Mike Moskowitz was uh, running running the group, and um, these CS so so in the setting of ischemic stroke, people gave NMDA antagonists, and uh, those NMDA antagonists they blocked the CSDs, um, and so one conclusion was like, okay, you block the CSDs, the mice actually got better, and does that mean that? Um, the mice got better because they blocked the CSDs. And the answer is you can't prove that because uh, NMDA receptor antagonists, they do all sorts of things and you could probably improve outcomes in ischemic stroke mice um, uh, even without blocking the CSDs because they have uh, the NMDA receptor antagonists have other neuroprotective effects, which obviously is like you block excitatory glutamate, right? Um, and so in this case, yeah, like I believe that ketamine is helpful for uh, stopping seizures, right? And so, but experimentally, you're giving this thing that can stop seizures, um, uh, but you're giving it to stop the CSDs. You stop the CSDs, and yet the seizures are worse, right? So that's that. That in my mind strengthens um, the conclusion that the CSDs are doing something helpful. That your block that CSDs are very helpful. They're even more helpful than giving a little bit of ketamine or NMDA receptor antagonist. So yeah, so I'm absolutely not saying to not give ketamine. Um, clinically, I, I think it's I think it's uh, great for stopping seizures. Um, it's just for this particular experimental design, it's helpful to show that CSDs can be beneficial. That's a great question. I'm really glad you asked that. Yeah, so um, so um, this next comment, uh, are cortical electrode strips consistently placed by our neurosurgeons? Yeah, so it, it takes a lot of effort. And so, um, you know, er Eric Rosenthal, who's the medical director of uh, the Neurocritical Care Unit, MGH, I mean, he, he he's had this, um, he's made this heroic effort um, to, uh, to have um, electrode, uh, strips placed or uh, intracranial um, uh, monitoring placed, um, and so it has it has to you have to have a champion basically to to be pushing for it. Um, and uh, on top of that, you need cooperation and collaboration. So that wouldn't be possible uh, with Eric, but it also wouldn't be possible with Aman Patel, who's uh, one of our cerebrovascular neurosurgeons, uh, or Chris Stapleton, who's the other cerebrovascular neurosurgeon. So you have to have buy-in from uh, for multiple groups. Um, but I want to make sure I answer your question. So yeah, so they're not they're not placed consistently, meaning not, not on every single patient. 
um, but uh, but there there are eras of of or epochs of time um, when we have uh, better opportunities to to place them for uh, place these um, monitors for 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 clinical or research purposes. Um, I would say that uh, back in the era of clipping uh, for subarachnoid hemorrhage, you'd be able to place more subdural strips, right? But now we're doing way more coiling, right? So you're placing less subdural strips uh, in subarachnoid hemorrhage. On the other hand, with traumatic brain injury, sometimes you just, you have a surgical lesion that you have to go and take out. Um, and um, and so in that case, you still have this opportunity to, to, to place a, an electrode strip. Yeah, he, he's a wonderful partner. He, he, he's really great to work with. Um, I, I had to take out, I really wanted to talk about EVD weaning and some of the work that I did um, uh, closely with, with uh, Dr. Patel, Aman Patel, with that, because you, we, we do, totally could not have uh, compared rapid versus gradual weans without buy-in from um, him specifically and, and from neurosurgery. But that, it's a topic for another talk. Well, you know, this, this is wonderful. I'm happy to take more questions. Um, also, just, you know, I'm also happy to chat with anybody. Um, and so please feel free to reach out. Um, I think this is my, my information is um, on, uh, if, if you if you look at uh, the website, you'll find my contact information. I think if you just Google me, you should be able to find my contact information. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk to trainees, um, uh, faculty and unit and anybody um, who's going down this path. All right. Um, I guess that's all the questions we have so far. Thank you so much for being with us, taking the time, and thank you for the wonderful lecture. All right. Thanks again. All right. Thanks, everyone.